everybody, and welcome to our sixth episode of Unleashed, where we aim to bring world-class thought leaders into your room, living room every Thursday. I'm your host, Jeff Tetz, CEO of Results. Our organization, Results, is filled with people that uh, are spending their lives uh, really trying to help other people achieve their full potential, and it's the only reason that we started this, uh, this weekly episode was to try to help the audience and the viewers take away some tools that are relevant for your personal lives, but also relevant for your organizations and for your teams to bring the best of your organizations to the front and center, bring uh, the best of your people to the front and center and really build, build a culture where people love uh, being at work every single day. So thanks to all of you who are joining us. We do this for you. And because we do this for you, it's really important to us that we receive feedback whenever we possibly can. So I have uh, one big request is that when the show is over today and you click on the leave meeting button, please click on the continue button afterwards on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. That's gonna direct you to a feedback page, which includes also some special offers to make an even bigger impact in your business uh, with your teams. And we're actually going to be offering a special limited workshop, a culture and connection, building high performance remote teams on June 3rd from 10 o'clock to 11.30 in the morning mountain time. There's only 30 spots available for that workshop. And you'll have the first chance as a, uh, as a viewer today to sign up for that exclusive workshop on June 3rd. Uh, we also have some exciting news. Our shop local contest went so well last week. We're bringing it, about, we're bringing it back again today. So one lucky viewer is going to win a $50 gift card for a shop local business of your choice. And here's how you enter. Using the hashtag results unleashed. So that's the hashtag results unleashed. You can make a post to Instagram, to Twitter, or LinkedIn about something that you took away from today's episode. And for every post that you make using that hashtag, you'll get one entry into the draw. The contest closes tonight. We also would like you to tag the shop local venue and business of your choice. And it's a big day uh, in a lot of locations where uh, restaurants are opening up at 50% capacity. And so you may be able to even use that gift card in person, whereas last week that was uh, much more difficult. And if you wanna just help, the spread, help spread the message in general, you can use that hashtag results unleashed anytime. Uh, we also wanna make it possible for the audience to ask questions of Sarah. And if you wanna get a question answered live on air, you have to go into the special Q&A box. There's a chat box and a Q&A box. The questions that we will answer will be only uh, taken from the Q&A box. And if we don't have a chance to get to them, you can certainly email us at info at unleashedresults.com and we'll be sure to answer your questions promptly and forward your questions to, uh, to Sarah as well. Uh, next week, in terms of a special uh, sneak peek, we're gonna be joined by internationally acclaimed leadership speaker and Wall Street Journal best-selling author and the creator of the renowned TED Talk, Everyday Leadership, Drew Dudley. He has a fascinating perspective on leadership that you're not gonna wanna miss. Now on with today's show, and we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, we're gonna be discussing connection in a disconnected world with Sarah Noel Wilson. When teams need to change, Sarah Noel Wilson gives them the tools to steer their own ship. Sarah is on a mission to help leaders understand themselves and their teams on a whole new level of understanding and closeness. Her goal is to empower leaders to understand and honor the beautiful complexity of the humans that they serve. Isn't that a wonderful way to phrase it? Sarah is an executive coach, a keynote speaker, a transformer of teams. She's a researcher and a soon to be author. I can't wait to read uh, what you're writing, Sarah. And she's really Come passionate on. about uh, helping leaders positively and powerfully impact those around them. She has 15 years of experience in leadership development a master's of science in leadership development from Drake University. She's a certified co-active coach, a certified conversational intelligence coach, and an adjunct professor and guest lecturer in leadership development. I can tell you if knowledge about how people connect and build relationships was a currency, she could retire today very comfortably. I'd be filthy rich. No. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can, I can concur based on the conversations that we've had over the last month as we prepared for today. So Sarah, uh, welcome. Why don't you tell us all where you're calling in from today? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited to connect with you today. I am calling in from Des Moines, Iowa. So middle of the United States, it is uh, beautiful, gloomy and rainy today, which is uh, you know, a fun place to be in. 
So it doesn't take long to know that you are a very purposeful person. You're mm -hmm. very, very clear about what your mission is and what you're trying to accomplish. Why don't you maybe just start off by telling us, why did you choose to take your career down, uh, down this path? Yeah, that's what, well, you know, it's interesting. I, I, something came up and you're like, you're a really purposeful person because my first reaction was not always, you know, most, most of my life I wasn't. And then I had some situations that came up that were like, oh, I need to be more intentional. So, um, you know, one thing that you didn't share in the bio is that my undergraduate degree was actually in theater performance and theater education. And so people are often confused. How did you go from the stage to the boardroom? And, um, and, you know, like any good Des Moines person, I got a job in insurance and uh, found myself fascinated with just the dynamic. And so what brought me on this path and what I'm really passionate about is when I started working in the corporate world, because I had no previous experience to that, is that I realized that people in positions of authority, right, I call them leaders, but they're really just people in positions of authority, not only can make or break a company, but they can make or break people. Mm -hmm. um, and so realizing that that power dynamic was there was really fascinating to me. And I just became really passionate about how can I set those people up for success so that they can create a ripple effect of the teams that they support. So, wow. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So we're, today we're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about connection. And there are so many different kinds of relationships in a person's life. Mm -hmm. I, don't think, I don't think much of anything happens without really strong relationships and deep connections within those relationships, whether it's a spouse, a personal relationship, uh, it's, uh, it's a colleague, it's a customer, what have you. There's so many different kinds of relationships and I'm sure there are differences uh, and nuances between those and then a lot of commonality and, uh, and patterns across the board on how we create connection and, and particularly interesting in this time where uh, the only sort of source of connection that we've had for the most part has been through technology and a computer screen now for the last couple of months. So Sarah, I, I'm just so curious for you to give us your perspective on the state of relationships and, and what's working right now and, and what isn't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think the first place, whenever we're talking about relationships and you hit the nail on the head from the standpoint of our success personally, professionally is so dependent and interdependent on the quality of our relationships. You know, unless we're living off the land in the woods by ourselves, right? We, dep we depend on this incredible um, ripple of different relationships. And so it's really important that if our success is dependent on the quality of our relationships, then we need to make sure that the quality of our relationships are really good. And, um, and a lot of times we leave relationships to chance. Like we all know they're important, we all want them to be good, but we get so busy with it, like tasks and everything else we're doing that we don't always give them the time and attention, right, to make them as strong as they can, as they can be. And, and, and there's certain, certainly, and we'll dig into more, um, a lot of things that are at play that are making it more difficult. Um, I had a client a couple weeks ago, it's like, I feel like it's impossible to build connections in this time. And it's like, well, it, it's hard. It's different. Like, I don't know. I don't know if it's harder. It depends, maybe. But it is different and we have to show up differently in, in our relationship. So, you know, I just want to, I want to talk about a couple of just truths about relationships and connecting. You know, the first is that our, most of our brain and body is wired for connection. I mean, our brain is constantly working to seek out people we trust, seek out people we feel safe with because that our survival, because I think sometimes we forget because we're such higher cognitive beings we forget we're animals, right? Like at, a, at its core is our brain's job is to make sure that we survive. And I am more likely to survive if I have a group of people, right? That I can feel safe with and that we can, you know, uh, attack the threats together and we can harvest food together, all those things that, that hasn't really changed in our brain. And so, so because of that, we're also very wired to seek out threats because again, that's going to threaten our livelihood and, and our sense of safety. And um, so I think that's one thing we have to understand is most of our brain function is, is seeking connection or seeking out who we shouldn't be connected with. Um, the other thing that I want to share about relationships just to start us off on is we, relationship building isn't something we just do some of the time. Like it's not like, hey, Jeff, let's work on relationship building now. And let's, you know, like these 15 minutes, we're going to build our relationship. So we have to realize that every single interaction we have. Every single interaction, whether it's an email, whether it's a video chat, whether it's 
Um, even, you know, I will tell you, as I was seeing names pop up, like of who's attending, I noticed a couple of my like fellow HR friends and I was like, oh, I love that they said, like just even that was a moment of connection of, oh, I see you, Michael, I see you, thank you for showing up. And um, so we have to realize that every single interaction we have, we're, we're either increasing the level of trust we have with someone, we're sustaining whatever level of trust we have, or we're actually decreasing it. There's is there no a, neutral. Is there, right? a ra is there a ratio that you ever talk about? I mean, because no, <laughs> nobody's perfect, even the best you know, relationship builders, the best givers uh, that we interact with, uh, we all do things uh, unknowingly, I think in particular, that probably take away from relationships? Uh, is there some kind of a ratio of sort of plus minus good to bad uh, that, that we're allowed to get away with and still build good connections? <laughs> I love that. Like, can I do nine things wrong and be okay? If I, <laughs> I mean, you know, also I mean, to that point, I mean, we, we do know that there, it's an interesting question. So a couple numbers that come up is, is one that we, we know that from a positive psychology perspective, we need to have like anywhere from you know six to eight positive interactions with somebody to offset a negative, but it's not it's not numerical because that one could be really significant and it's just gonna erase every good thing you you know you did. But I think but I think what you hit upon is something really important, and this is one of my like my cardinal rule of relationships is you're gonna mess them up. Yeah, you yeah. just will. Like we're humans, we're complex, we, we get tired, we have our needs, and my needs might be different than your needs. And so, you know, instead of, no, that doesn't give you permission to just be a jerk. Like, well, you know, Sarah said we're going to screw them up, so here we go. Um, but to realize that, I mean, we are just always going to have what, what I, I love Dr. Uh, John Gottman. He's a big researcher on, on relationships, particularly around marriages and parenting. Um, and so we will always have regrettable events. They're just an inevitable part of relationships. So it's how do it's not how do we avoid those? I mean, that's part of it. But how do we recover when that happens? Right. Yeah. And I know that I think that's something we're going to get into a little bit later. Rebuilding yeah. and recovering uh, in, yeah. in relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, tell us what else you're finding about uh, about relationships during uh, during this time. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think a, a couple of things, you know, well, I mean, again, and we're going to, we'll talk into way more detail about those challenges, but I want to paint a little bit of a picture and, and like kind of get up to the 30 foot level, not 30 foot, 30,000 foot. 30,000, yeah. 30, 30 foot's not very tall. Um, but we have to realize that there, when it comes to relationships and connections, there's a chemistry that happens, that there's a chemistry that happens when we feel connected to somebody. There's a chemistry that happens. And when I say chemistry, I'm not talking um, like uh, woo-woo energetic. I mean, biologically, the chemistry in my body makeup is changing simply because Jeff, you and I have a high level of trust together. How I feel, the, the hormones, the chemicals that my body's producing right now is very different because we have a high level of trust. So we have to recognize that it's not just a feeling of do I feel safe or do I not, but that there is hormones and chemicals that are changing in our body depending on the nature of that relationship. And then the, the other side of when we think about, you know, what I call the chemistry of connection is we also have to understand that um, where, where we are, uh, chemically can change how that experience is. And so we're going to talk, I want to talk a little bit more about that. So, you know, there's the two simplest way to think about relationships is that, you know, we have a chemical called cortisol, right? It's our stress. It's what triggers us to move into a fight, flight, freeze response. And when cortisol is really high, we know that we're less likely to be able to be connected. Um, whereas when we're bonded, our brains produce oxytocin. And for people who might be like, oh, I think I've heard of that. Often it's, you know, used when we talk about mothers, uh, you know, it's like the mother's hormone, but both men and women have high level, like we have levels of oxytocin. And what's cool about relationships is that if we think about it through the lens of the chemistry, it can influence how we show up differently. So I'll pause there because I want to get into the amygdala, but I want to make see if you have any thoughts about what I just shared. Yeah, no, I, I have questions and I'm going to save some of them, I think, uh, till further into the conversation, Sarah, because I do want to get into the neuroscience of things. Mm. And it's, 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 uh, I think it's one of the things that people show up to this show for is they, uh, they want to understand the science. They want to understand the stories so then they can then be a bit more intentional about, about how they approach uh, their day, their, their lives, their interactions. 
Uh, so uh, let's get into some of that neuroscience that, yeah. you, that you speak about. You know, we call that the how to, the how to, we can't get to the how to until we understand the why do. Yeah. Like, why do we do what we do that actually yeah. gets in the way so we can get yeah. to that. So yeah, I, sure. so I want to introduce you to my favorite part of the brain. And I am, I'm convinced that like the world would change if people really understood this and, and better understood how it impacted them. And that is, I want to introduce you to the amygdala. I realized I should have worn my amygdala shirt. Um, and so, so the reason that I want to talk about the amygdala, and I don't care if you remember how it's pronounced, I'll give you a fun way to remember it. But the reason that this, this particular part of our brain is so important is because it does a number of things. So let's, let me just in a simplest way explain what the amygdala does. So the amygdala is part of our primitive brain. It's part of our brain that's some of the first that's formed. And one of its functions is to scan the environments for threats. It's constantly on. And, and when I say it's scanning the environments for threats, what I mean is that it's looking for threats to us physically. Um, it's looking for threats to us emotionally, psychologically. It's looking for threats to our ego, right? When somebody, maybe if you put a post on social media and somebody disagrees, and you're like, ooh, that felt a little, that's your amygdala responding. And one of the ways I like to think about the amygdala is I like to think of it like a neurotic chihuahua, right? That at any moment, it's just gonna like bark and like be ready to attack it. So I have a dog, um, I have a neurotic chihuahua. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, so let me introduce you to Seymour. And I like using him because, particularly this photo, because, you know, I, I don't know, Jeff, when you look at this, is it like, oh, he's, he's thoughtful. He's, you know, just contemplating life's great, you know, Think Seymour is making sure that nobody comes within 100 feet of our house, right? Like he's the dog that sleeps in radar position. And if we can go back to the amygdala slide for a minute, um, I want to talk about why it's so important for us to understand the amygdala hijacking. Because what happens is that our brain is constantly scanning, even if we're not aware of it, and it can move to a threat based response in 0 0.07 seconds. So we can move to a threat-based response and it's faster than we're even aware of. And what happens is that a couple of things um, sort of happen very quickly. So when our amygdala hijacks our brain, that's the term, because it's taking over, it kicks off cortisol, it kicks off adrenaline, it kicks off noradrenaline. And um, what it does is it starts to shut down. We lose access to our higher functioning parts of our brain. So the reason this is all important to relationship is because when this, when this thing, triggers and floods our system, we, we lose access to our prefrontal cortex. And that is where things like, you know, logic, reasoning, problem solving live. We also, what research shows is we lose access to things like empathy, our ability to listen. I was just reading um, recently that when, when our stress response is really high, we actually lose access to our ability to be able to read and interpret people's emotions and their faces. And so we're more likely to interpret it more negatively. So you, you can imagine that if you aren't aware that this could be happening at any time, you could be going into a situation and already it's setting that relationship up for failure because you aren't realizing that your amygdala is triggered. The other thing that's a fun fact about this is that those cortisol, adrenaline, noradrenaline, that's all surging through your body to put you into that fight or flight response, it takes about a good 24 hours for it to fully metabolize. And the reason this is important like, Jeff, um, have you ever gone to bed mad? Have you ever broken the like partner spousal, you know, rule of, because everyone tells you that on your wedding day, don't go to bed mad. Yeah, right? I've, uh, I, have, I have been there before. Yes. And probably so, one of the reasons I've never been married. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's part, well, I mean, I would argue that I think it's actually healthy sometimes to go to bed mad. And the reason is the reason we feel better the next day is not because we slept on it, it's because our body has had time to metabolize those chemicals and now we actually have access to the higher functioning parts of our brain. So, so the reason, uh, yeah. I have, to, I have to, I'm just wondering though, that it, doesn't that sort of assume that, we're, that there was only one stressor or one source of stimulus that triggered oh, it? And I, and like, sure. how do you, like, I feel like you're, uh, an average person's brain is gonna be in constant recovery mode. And I, and I don't know if you wanna answer that now or you wanna come back to that, but I yeah. just can't help uh, ask that question in the, in the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, we're constantly hit by a barrage of stressors and now we're being hit with like, I don't even know, I mean, even more every day, right? We're being hit with different things. And so, 
there is an element of always sort of in recovery. I mean, this is why, you know, part of how we have really healthy relationships with people is first, we have to be able to regulate ourselves. Like I have to be able to, to know when I'm having a stress response. I have to know how to like regulate, soothe and calm myself down so that I can show up more powerfully in the moment. Because the reality is, is if I'm walking around and this amygdala is running the show, I will never be able to build as effective as, as effective of relationships as I would when I'm in a deep, what they call a deregulated state. So I think, I think actually, you mean, so one, I wanted, I wanted to share one more quick kind of fun fact of like fun thing about the amygdala and let's talk about the stresses that are happening now that are really impacting our relationships. Um, I first became aware of the amygdala when I was diagnosed with a panic disorder about seven years ago now. Is that how long it's been? Seven years. And, and for those of you who struggle with any kind of mental illnesses, mental challenges, which we all have brains and we all experience that, um, the amygdala is part of why people, it, it, it strongly impacts people who have anxiety um, or depression because it's overactive, right? That you're hyper aware, you're hyper alert, you're hyper nervous. So I had a t-shirt made that said, I heart my amygdala as a way to embrace her, right? To just embrace this. And when I wear it out, people will often stop me and say like, that's a really cool shirt. Uh, who's Amy G. Dalla? Is she some kind of, you know, singer? So if you can slip to the third, yeah. So a fun way to remember is just Amy G. Dalla. I worked with a leadership team once and we were talking about this concept and how it can show up. And, um, and they decided that going forward for all their leadership team meetings, at least at the time, um, they were going to add Amy G. Dalla as a participant on all of their like invitation lists as a reminder that at any moment, any one of them could be triggered and it could influence how they show up. So that's a fun way to remember the amygdala is Amy G. Dalla. Yeah, absolutely. So you're in a meeting and you yeah. feel, you feel a wave of, mm. of, uh, of emotion sort of coming over you. How core, how much of a correlation is there to, um, you know, um, EQ and, and self-awareness that enables a person to recognize exactly what's happening and not be totally owned by it versus being totally overcome and your, and, and, and your behavior and your actions are owned by what's happening inside your brain. Yeah. Well, I mean, self-awareness is everything to regulating it, right? Which mm -hmm. is like the cornerstone of emotional intelligence. And it's, and we can't, can't always stop it because, you know, like I was saying, it starts, it's triggers in 0 0.07 seconds. You know, the other thing we have to understand is our brain will move to that threat-based response, whether it's a real threat or an imagined threat. It doesn't know the difference. So maybe you're in a meeting and somebody says something like, wow, they just really slighted me. And you can feel it, my heart's racing, my neck starts to turn red, my face starts to feel warm. And one of the ways that we can start to recover and navigate this is, yeah, just simply noticing when is my amygdala triggered. So here's a really, really powerful practice people can do to start building that self-awareness is, one, I would be curious for people to think about, you know, think about times when you're, you've been triggered. Like, think back, and what did it feel like? Because we all have different responses. For me, my, my heart will race, and that, and that heart race is because of the adrenaline, right, that's flowing through our system. Other people, their neck gets really red, right? They're the yeah. red neckers. Yeah. Um, and so even just starting to pay attention to that and noticing it. So, and so what's tricky is being able to catch it in the moment, right? Because our brain is already, like, not logical. And so how do we slow it down so that we can catch it? Uh, one, the more we can practice being aware of that stress response, the more likely we can start to take some actions. And there's two really simple practices for how we can calm down that stress response. The first is taking a really nice deep breath. And the reason that we wanna do this is that when our, when our stress is triggered, when our amygdala is hijacking, right? And it's kicking off all of those um, chemicals um, it's actually like it's shutting down access to things. It's called our vagus nerve, right? And the vagus nerve is part of what allows us um, to be able to read and interpret people's emotions. And it also is part of what calms down the amygdala. So deep breathing actually massages our organs. Like it's not deep breathing because it gives us something to focus on. There's a very chemical thing that happens when we take a deep breath. So take a deep breath. And then the second thing is take a break. Yeah. Like if you and I are really triggered and I can feel that I'm heated, yeah. I think the best thing we could do for the relationship is to say, I'm not in a good place right now for us to continue this conversation. Can we follow up tomorrow when I've had some time to like process it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I've always thought that the, the best relationships are the ones uh, that are, you're taking care of each other. 
and whoever's on higher ground uh, sort of has a responsibility to take mm. take some care of the person that might be on lower ground. And yeah. are, are there different approaches other than what you've mentioned? Uh, so if you noticed that I was going into that state of, of uh, being overrun with cortisol, my stress response was firing, what could you do to maybe help me that might be different than, than uh, helping yourself? Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, one thing is, one thing is just asking people, you know, talk to me about what you're feeling right now. Yeah. And the reason that's a powerful practice is because you're asking people to use language. And when we use language, it lights up our prefrontal cortex and it shows that when we can activate that, it actually starts to, it's like, you know, if the amygdala is the chihuahua who's like, rah, 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 what was that? When we can start to activate that other part of our brain through language, through, right, you know, um, it actually starts to calm it down. Yeah. So that's a simple way is to, I mean, obviously like don't shame people. Don't, don't be like, uh, Jeff, your amygdala is really triggered. It's not going to go, it's not going to go well. If you say that, <laughs> just learn from experience. It's not going to yeah. go well. Yeah. Although um, just saying the word might, might draw a laugh and, uh, and re reduce, diminish the situation. Yeah. I mean, some, I mean, sometimes like with my husband, I'll be like, I'm just going to be very clear. The Chihuahua is running the ship right now. So I just need to take some time and we both know, you know, what that means and to be able yeah. to respond. But I think, but I think the reason that I start with this, especially now, right? Because the whole point of this is how do we stay connected during this disconnection is we have to realize that all of us are experiencing a significant amount of prolonged stress that we've never experienced before, right? And I want to I don't want to talk about a couple of things that um, more specifically, right? So um, one is we have a real physical threat. This isn't an imagined threat. There is a threat, and depending on your level of health, depending on your level of risk taking, that threat may seem really high or that threat may seem really low. Um, we just yesterday we had to have somebody do some uh like utility work and we didn't realize that he needed to come into the house and before we knew it he was walking into the house and my amygdala triggered now before before all of this it would have been like no big deal here's the room here's what you know, do you want some dr pepper or something you're like can i help you out can we chat and you know because the physical threat is high now things are responding more quickly so we just have to realize that we're, we're in the state of sort of a chronic awareness of a potential physical threat. The other thing that's impacting our stress right now is this whole idea of uh, collective grieving, right? That, that we're either grieving loss of potentially people, um, um, but most of us are grieving some kind of loss of the way of living, you know? I, I want baseball back on. I want to be able to go see my family. Like that's a lot, that's a real loss that I'm experiencing. And then we have this anticipatory loss that's happening now because now that we're two months into it, I think we're all starting to figure out like, oh, this isn't a, we're gonna go back to normal. Like there's gonna be this new path forward and we're gonna be doing something new and different for quite a while. So there's this anticipatory grieving that's happening as well. I'm curious to know people who are listening, you know, how many of you are finding yourself exhausted on these Zoom calls? right? And so there's this extra stimulation, both from the standpoint of, um, you know, I, my brain knows Jeff is here, my brain sees you, but my body can tell you're not here. And it creates this dissonance. Not only that, but, you know, I, I, I'm trying really hard not to look at myself. I'm basically like talking to myself right now, and I'm trying to talk to you, Jeff, but our brain naturally is like, wow, is that what I look like when I, you know, um, chat? And then connected to that is just we're all experiencing this novelty fatigue. Um, you know, even setting up for this, it's, I have to figure out, you know, do I have the lighting set up? Do I, do, what do I need to do to prop up things? And so we're having to navigate things that we could be on autopilot before um, and having to be really conscious of it. So whether that's like, okay, kids aren't being, going to school right now. T okay, so somebody just shared, yeah, totally exhausted, especially someone who, yeah, it's, I mean, here's what I want to say. I love this. So I'm married to an introvert. He is exhausted already. I'm an extrovert. I yeah. live for connection and I'm exhausted, right? Just because yeah. of the level of stimulation that's happening. And, and so we're constantly having to figure out these new ways of navigating. I have to figure out a new way of ordering my, like getting groceries. I have to figure out new ways of, okay, we have to take the dog to the vet. How do we do that? How do we do it safely? Or we have to, this guy needs to come in. And so we're experiencing this novelty fatigue. And I think, the, you know, another thing that I think is important um, to call out that I, I don't see as many people talking about, and Jeff, you and I have had conversations about this, is that, um, you know, this pandemic is very clearly showing those of us who have privilege, those of us who have, 
and those who have not. And it is disproportionately affecting people who are already either in like a socio, lower socioeconomic perspective, or even just if their type of business was one that was significantly impacted. So there's also for some people a real challenge with survivor guilt. You know, right. when I talk to my colleagues whose businesses are just dead in the water right now, and I'm still like keeping busy, that can add an additional layer of stress. So that's all those things that are happening. And I, and, and, you know, I hope I like articulating some of those um, people, right? Yeah. People are sharing. It's a new way to handle children. They have no idea what's going on yeah. and you have yeah. zoom meetings and then they pop in and now you're trying to figure out how do I parent this and how do I still look like professional and like I'm the CEO, but my three-year-old wants to sit on my lap right now. And how do I navigate that? Yeah. There's a lot, uh, a lot to unpack in what you've said there. And, and there's a couple of terms that I have not heard uh, very often and especially the novelty fatigue one. Mm. Now, so are you suggesting that the longer this plays out, if, if we had to stay in this virtual world for a prolonged period, that eventually we would stop being sort of stressed out and having our energies up to the level that we are right now because we would eventually get used to it? Some. I mean, okay. there will be some things, but because things are evolving and uncertain, we're also always going to be trying to figure out what's next. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, but there's certainly there's some patterns that are already that were new before, but they aren't now. Um, yeah, so somebody mentioned that people are more understanding with kids. In the beginning, that was way more disruptive. And now it's like, if I don't see my team member, you know, Teresa's, you know, daughter, Bryn, it's weird. Like, I just yeah. know Bryn's going to show up and we're going to have a moment where we acknowledge her. So there will be things that will become normal. And then there will be new things that we have to navigate. And, and so, so I want to actually want to pause on this point of um, novelty fatigue because there's some really interesting research from Dr. Bruce Perry. He's this phenomenal psychologist who, who focuses a lot on trauma-informed response. Yeah. And um, one of the ways we can build up our resiliency reserves, like one of the ways we can recharge, is actually to do something familiar. You know, so yes, self-care, eating well, working out, getting sleep, all those things are very, very important. But one of the other ways we can start to recharge is to watch a really familiar movie, read a book you've already read, um, something that can give your brain a break from all the novelty that we're experiencing. And so for those of you who are, you know, binge watching TV shows that you've already watched before, yeah. there's a reason those are soothing right now. It's because it's calming down that novelty fatigue and allowing you to recharge a little bit. That's really well said. I can identify with that. And I, you know, I, I experienced uh, that I can only handle probably, I'm going to say three Zoom meetings a day, and I'm trying to be intentional with my time about scheduling it that way and declining or trying to move meetings to other platforms if it can't be moved to a different day. And then uh, 6, 6.30 at night, I, I'm, 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 I'm done, I'm tapped out. And, and I do find myself sort of clinging for the Netflix documentary or something that's interesting, but it's not going to require a lot of uh, a, a lot of a lot of thought pattern for sure yeah. uh, well said I want to take this opportunity to just to remind people of a couple of things if you have questions for Sarah uh, please put them in the Q&A box we've got some questions coming in there and then the other part is the shop local contest so if you post something to social media until midnight tonight using the hashtag results unleashed and tagging your favorite shop local business with a tip or a tool or something that you took away from today's discussion you'll get an entry uh, for a $50 gift card uh, by doing so so uh, Sarah, let's, uh, we've got some questions now sort of coming in uh, about survival guilt and sort of saying yeah. like, whoa, let's pause there and ask about what, uh, what, what that means. So do you want to elaborate more on what's causing us to feel the survivor guilt piece right now? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, so survivor, survivor, survivor guilt, you know, I don't know, Mike, my brain is also glitchy because of the like fatigue, right? That happens with this. But I mean, that happens when you, I mean, it's implicit in the name, right? That I survived something that other people didn't. And so it, it, we, we uh, unconsciously start to question, was I worthy of it? Should I have done it? Feeling bad, feeling, you know, worrying about what the impacts are, um, you know, in, in a really extreme place, you can see survivor guilt when there's something like a really tragic accident, somebody survives a plane crash, right? Um, but it also can happen in things that we don't always think about. Um, I, you know, years ago during the financial crisis, we, the day that they laid off a bunch of people was the day they promoted me. It was a pretty awkward situation to be in, to be like, Hey, it's not all bad news. Sarah got promoted. And you're just like, I don't like, I feel really horrible right now. And so how this is showing up is, 
especially for those of you out here who are listening, who run your own businesses, or maybe you work for companies um, who are doing okay. I mean, there are companies that are thriving right now. There are some companies that are surviving pretty well. And then there's a lot of companies that are just being decimated. And so, you know, I mean, I sit there and I look at it and I go, my husband and I are financially secure. We have the, the means to be able to order groceries. We have the means to be able to, you know, take care of our basic needs. Um, the business is okay. And so when I talk to somebody who might not be experiencing that, sometimes it can be hard to connect or you feel like, ah, I don't want to, you know, when they're like, well, how, I mean, you understand how's business going for you? And you're like, things are actually like, okay for us. And so, I mean, it just, it just, it, you know, especially people who are um, more empathetic, it can create a lot of anxiety. I don't yeah. know if I explained that right, but. Yeah, it, you are. And there's, a, and then I think there's, when I'm, when I, when I think what, one of the things that I'm noticing uh, is that it, people don't want to come across as um, having an, uh, a high level of bravado to what you're saying. Like we're mm -hmm. successful and everyone's failing and we pivoted and nobody else has. And my perspective on that is I, as I think it's incumbent upon companies that are somehow finding a way to do well, to share the things yes. that they have done to, to become that way, not from an, a place of ego, but from a place of wanting to raise, raise the community, you know, the rising yeah. tides raise all ships type of a thing. But we need that inspiration. And everybody that I know that's successful is, is building on other people's successful ideas. Yeah. So by you sharing something that you have done, think of it less as you bragging and more about you trying to lift the community. And I think yeah. that that's important. Now, the other part that I don't have an answer for is we all know about self care and we have to get rest. We have to eat well, drink water, limit alcohol, get a good night's sleep, uh, uh, you know, get that, that walk or that run or that exercise in. But I'm finding it personally. And, and, uh, and for many people that I talk to, it's hard to give ourselves permission to do those things when there's so much to do and everything that we can get done for the business mm. gets, it gets us one step closer to hopefully hiring people back that we've had to temporarily let go. So yeah. like, how do I go for a run at night or clear my head and meditate when there's something I could do that's going to maybe make a difference in somebody else's life? Do you have any commentary on how we can somehow get over that, that, um, that, that mindset? Yeah. I mean, you know, a reframe that I use is that is part of the work. Like my self-care is not in addition to my self-care isn't a bonus. My self-care is actually part of the work that if I'm going to show up powerfully for my clients, if I'm going to show up powerfully for my team, I need to make sure that I'm recharged, that I'm rested, that I, you know, like I'm taking care of that. So some of it is a reframe. The other thing I just, I want to hit on because you talked about a couple of things, like, I don't know about you, but my brain has gone to like craving foods when I was a kid. Like, oh yeah, if I could just get a little Debbie snack cake, that just sounds delicious right now. And part of it is when our brain goes into survival mode, it wants to be comforted, it wants to be soothed. And a lot of times the way it gets soothed is by things that, you know, like have been with us for a while. The other thing that I, that I, I think is really important to hit up, I know we're going off on a, like a tangent right now, but I think it's important that when we are experiencing prolonged exposures to stress, um, when we are experiencing prolonged exposures to stress, a couple of things are happening. One, we are going to fatigue way faster. So maybe I could normally work 10, 11 hour days and be okay. But because of this, like I'm going to be exhausted by the end of it. The other thing is that we know that the longer the brain is under stress, one of the first things to go is time. Like time collapses. It's like we're, we're unable to think long term. We're unable to, our sense of time gets all off. Everyone I've talked to is struggling with sleep right now. And some of that is not that you're choosing not to sleep. It's because your brain is like, I, like, I'm in survival mode right now. And so I need yeah. to stay awake. I think that, you know, to your point about like, don't brag, lift. I think somebody posted that mm -hmm. is, you know, when we're, when we're coming from a place of bragging, it's power over somebody. Mm -hmm. Like I'm telling you how good I am. Because I want to make sure you know how much better I am than you. Like yeah. that's a brag. Yeah. But sharing information, that's different. Right. Or just here's some of the things we did. Yeah. The other thing that I would say is that one of the ways I know for me, um, you know, going back to connection is if there, if I can give more, whether that's supporting other businesses, whether that's um, you know donating, whether that's you know whatever that looks like, that if we are in that that halves if you will, 
then like we need to make sure we're giving out as much as we can and so you know for us once we became stabilized as a company and we realized like oh we're going to be okay then we were like so what other partners do we have that we know are struggling and how can we start using them now to at least inject yeah. a little bit of like cash flow into their system yeah absolutely we have a lot to get to here yeah so, we do and uh, but there is there's a very interesting question if and i don't know if there's a quick answer to it and we may have yeah. to take i'll try up. Uh, and and it, it comes from uh, <clears throat> from Jeff Lloyd, who's a question, who's a client of ours. So we may be able to answer this in the client overtime afterwards. Sure. But is there a chemical reaction transfer amongst people? So Jeff yeah. is asking. Uh, so Jeff is asking if he's about to meet you for the first time, Sarah, and you know that he knows me and you trust me. Will you inherently yeah. uh, you inherently trust Jeff Lloyd just because you know that, that you and I know each other and hit you and him or that he, he and I know each other? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, we're, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, there's, there's a chemical transaction that happens just because we're, you know, with each other that, you know, depending on how we, we step into that relationship, um, we are, you know, so let me, let me answer that two ways quickly. One is you extending that, like, uh, there's a, like a trust bridge, if you will. Like, well, because you trust him, I'm more likely to trust him than yeah. I would have not. Familiarity is one of the ways we can build trust. It's why I can walk around Iowa and maybe like, I don't know who I trust, who I don't, but if I go to like Walt Disney World and I see somebody wearing a Hawkeye jersey, I'm like, oh, familiar, I trust you because you're like me, right? Yeah. And you're similar. So so that, that, that definitely is the case. And then the... Um, the, the other thing is we have to recognize is that our emotions are contagious. Our chemicals are contagious. When we, now it's interesting, and I don't know what the research is virtually, but physically, when we get in about 10 feet of somebody, our bodies start to mirror each other. Our, our brain neurons, they call them mirror, neur mirror neurons, start to like mimic each other. My heart starts to beat rhythmically how yours is. I mean, there's a very chemical thing. So that's, that's why when I said earlier that if we're gonna build connection, I need to make sure I'm in a place where I'm calm, regulated, and can mm -hmm. be in a place to be right, you know, like right. to build that connection. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, you have people who just walk in the room, you're like, I don't know what it is about them. They just, they just light it up, right? Like yeah. it's just, and it makes me feel good when I talk to them. And yeah. that's part of that like contagion that happens with emotions. And then the flip side is true, oh man, you know, so-and-so is just like going down the rabbit hole again, and I'm just exhausted after talking to them. Um, yeah. So we have to realize there's a contagion with our emotions. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So I know there's, you have a slide on yeah. some of the language that, that gets in the way of relationships unbeknownst to us most of the time. And I, yeah. and I would like, I'd like to get to that slide and, and have you talk about that a bit, Sarah. I think it's important. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about how when cortisol is high, it's harder for us to connect. And when oxytocin is high, it's easier. What research shows is there's specific language that we use that can intentionally or unintentionally downregulate that brain, right? Trigger that, trigger that um, amygdala to trigger. And there is language we can use that can actually increase the likelihood of connection. So I just want to make sure I give proper uh, shout out. So this is from the work of conversational intelligence, Judith E. Glazer, who is my former teacher and mentor who, who we lost um, recently, um, did a lot of research understanding the neuroscience of trust and how does that show up in conversations. And so I just wanna walk through, through this. We know that if there's language that is exclusive, that is excluding people, um, if it's judgmental, if it's limiting, if it's like limiting or withholding information, if you're coming from a place of all knowing, right? I mean. We've either had those moments or we worked with somebody who was like, well, no, this is just what we're going to do, right? And you start to go like, mm, okay. Um, when we dictate and when we criticize, if we're consistently communicating in those patterns, we know that that's far more likely to put somebody into a triggered stress response. Um, like here's a, you know, here's a good example um, that I share. Uh, again, 2008 financial crisis we get an email from our senior leader saying that they're going to lay off people. I'm, I'm receiving it at the same time that my team is receiving it. So I like, have no answers for them. I go to my boss and I say, hey, are we gonna talk about this? And her response was, talk about what? And so there was this like withholding of information and not even withholding, just not acknowledging what had just happened. And this, I wanna be very clear, this wasn't her, her being naive or didn't know this email went out. This was, I'm not gonna talk about this. We're not even gonna acknowledge it. So you can imagine the trust that decreased in that moment of like, oh, okay. 
But the cool thing is, is that there's language we can use that will naturally increase uh, oxytocin in the other person and that therefore will create a, a, a greater amount of connection and bonding. So like inclusive language. And, and here's an example of that. Um, let's say you have a team member that you're like, wow, they, they're really good at this and I wanna make sure we include them on this team. Well, um, maybe you send them an email and say, hey, I want you to join this meeting, but there's a way you can add the inclusive language of, I'm adding you to this meeting because I really value your insights and I wanted to make sure your voice was heard. You can imagine how that would feel for that team member to be like, oh wow, like they chose me versus just, oh, what does Jeff want me to work on now? Right. Um, so appreciating, expanding, sharing, discovering, developing and celebrating. We know that these are all patterns of, of words and language that when we use them authentically, because here's, this is a key thing. I was working with a group and I was sharing this and it was a bank, it was a, I don't know what it says, it was a financial industry. And um, one of the bankers goes, but couldn't you be manipulative? Like, couldn't I be manipulative? And, you know, I was like, um, well, so first of all, I'm curious about the question behind the question, but, yeah. um, but I was like, we have really good BS meters. You know, we, um, we, we have, we have a really good sense of very quickly being able to evaluate is your, are you authentic or aren't you? And so if you are coming from a place of like, Ooh, look, I'm going to manipulate their chemistry so I can build connection. I mean, like it's going to have the reverse effect because people will know. And so the way that we build connection is by actually caring. We're just going to be more intentional about how we show that care. Right. Right. Now, one of the uh, questions that's coming in here from Sarah, Sarah Winberg. Uh, so hi, Sarah and hi, Jeff. Sarah. So, so the company that Sarah works for has been set up for remote work. Mm. Uh, and, and in this new, uh, this new uh, work arrangement hasn't had a negative impact on us work-wise. However, our partners and clients are having more hurdles getting used to the new normal and in a lot of cases have abandoned their normal behavior and processes, uh, especially for communication. It is straining on the relationship and I'm trying to be empathetic and supportive. Mm -hmm. It feels like all relationships are at risk right now. Uh, what, do I, what do I do with that? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it, uh, well, one, thank you for that question. And it's a big one because mm -hmm. again, we're all in this heightened state, right? So things like, we're fatiguing faster, we're getting, you know, more frustrated quickly, all of that. And the same is true of our clients. Um, there's, there's a really simple model of trust. And it's a, think of it as like a triangle. And I'm like, my camera's a little out of focus right now. Because <laughs> I put my hands up and it doesn't know where to, so imagine triangle. a triangle. Yeah. And, and there's three, or it's stool, right? And one, one, one leg of it is authenticity. Um, do, do, are you who you say you are? One leg of it is um, empathy. Do you care about me? And the other leg of it is um, logic. Do I trust your logic and can you communicate it? What we're finding is, especially right now, we have to lean so much more heavily on that empathy piece. And I think that if that is not a normal part of our communication with clients, it needs to become that, right? We have to not just have transactional conversations with them. And so, so I want to share with you some specific, you know, language and phrases is that when people are struggling emotionally with something, sometimes our default is we want to fix it. We want to jump in and we want to solve it, or we want to offer a perspective, or we want to, you know, well, you should just do this or look at the bright side, you, you know, or whatever the case is. And one of the most powerful ways we can show somebody that we care, we've heard them is simply to like acknowledge the pain you see. I can see how hard this is for you. I can hear how frustrated you are. So if you have a client who's like, oh, all these Zoom calls and we don't have the technology, whatever, to be able to, to, to just acknowledge the emotions they're experiencing with, like I can, I can hear how frustrating this is. Let's work together to figure this out. Or I can see that this has been a challenge or I can see how important it is to you, you know, that we get the chance to connect in this way. And so, so you know, when I said at the top of the hour, like we have to do things differently, um, it's, we just have to be more conscious of it. We have to spend more time checking in. We have to spend more time checking in from a personal level. Just how are you doing really? You know, just like what's, what's happening in your world. And, um, and sometimes it sounds really simple, but when we go back to that novelty fatigue, I I'm finding for myself and I'm trying to be intentional with some of my clients about it as well Is I don't zoom all the time. Sometimes just a phone call is, um, is all we need. 
you know, because it feels familiar. It's not as stimulating. And it, it sometimes feels a little bit more personal of like, hey, I just wanted to call because I was thinking of you. So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but oh. to realize that we have to lean on that empathy more and, and not just feel it, but we have to say it. We have to let people know that we see their frustration, we hear it and work with them to solve it and not just jump into like putting out the fire. Yeah, and the environment is not, uh, is not conducive right now to having time to be as thoughtful as we might normally be. Yeah. Uh, for all the things that, that we've discussed. And I, I was interested to find a couple of uh, research-based statistics in, in preparation for today. Uh, that they really, they did, really did surprise me. The first one was that it only takes 40 seconds to create a meaningful connection with somebody. So if you say, well, I don't have time for that right now. We got to get stuff done. Well, 40 seconds of just intentional time with somebody can be all it takes. Just slow down, take a breath, listen, really deeply listen, ask the right questions, use the right language as you're saying. The other thing was that uh, there's a lot of isolation and loneliness right now that people mm -hmm. are experiencing. And to feel connected in the work environment, uh, you would think, okay, well, how many people do you need to be deep friends with at work for that to happen? And the answer, it turns out, is one. Yeah. You only have to have one meaningful friendship at work to feel connected to your organization. So there's a bit of dividing and conquering that can take place there too. You know, the management team can say, okay, we've got 40 employees to keep in touch with. We each take uh, responsibility for 10 of them and we connect with them, you know, five a week or uh, whatever it might be. And I, and I know there's an exercise I wanted to get to because you had an exercise that, that companies can do with, uh, with their employees to, uh, to foster some connection, whether yeah. it's a virtual, virtual world or not. So I wanna, I wanna get to that exercise, Sarah. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so, so it's, it's listening to connect, it's listening to learn. And so we all know listening is important. We know this. Um, and yet what, what research shows is that there's a great study, there's 8,000 employees, they ask themselves to self-assess, how good of a listener are you? It's like 82% was like, I'm, I'm an above average listener, right? And, and then um, they asked, well, how good of listeners are your coworkers? About the same damn amount said below average. And it's like, well, someone's lying, right? And so I wanna offer this framework and then give you some specific things and we'll, we'll do it real quickly here. Okay. So typically we walk around this world listening from a place of what does this mean to me? All of you on this call right now who are watching, with the exception of maybe like, maybe there's one person, but most of you are going, what does this mean to me? How can I apply this? Is this valuable to my work, to my clients, to my family? I'm guessing most of you probably haven't had the thought, I wonder how Sarah's feeling right now. I wonder how she's feeling about it. And when we want to build connections, we have to shift our listening from what does this mean to me to what does this mean to them? And I want to share with you, we're, gonna, we're actually going to do this. We're going to do it live. Okay. Uh, simple exercise that um, you can build this up and you don't have to do the exercise, but I want to showcase how powerful, how we can share what we've heard matters. So Jeff, I'm just going to ask you I, what I want is that we, well, okay, before we do that real quickly, okay. we have to understand that our brain is naturally wired to hear what you have to say, go to my archives and go, oh, I've had that experience too. Okay. To build connection. But the challenge is, is that we tend to stay in our story. Like we stay in my story instead of coming back to yours. So one of the ways we can think about how do we build up our listening is to notice when do I make it about me, catch it and bring it right back to you. Mm -hmm. And so as Jeff is telling the story, I want all of us who are on the line to notice, I want you to listen to what is he saying? What is he not saying? How is he saying it? And I want you to catch every time you go, oh, he mentioned getting a promotion. I've gotten a promotion before and I'm on the Sarah train for a while instead of bringing it right back to him. So uh, Jeff, what I'd want to hear from you is I want, I want you to share with us just for like a minute and a half, a, um, uh, something you're really proud of, an accomplishment you've had personally, professionally, could be big or small, okay. doesn't matter, but just something that you're truly proud of and you can, you were I'm part of it somehow. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that jumps out to me then would be uh, 22 years ago, so 19, uh, 1998, uh, a couple of uh, friends I played hockey with uh, passed away, uh, separate incidents within two months of each other. And I had an idea to organize a memorial game in their honor the next season. And all the proceeds from the ticket sales for the game would go towards uh, uh, a scholarship that would be given out every single year in, in a, to a future player in their honor and it it became this huge thing where 
Uh, we, we sold out the arena in Fort Saskatchewan, uh, 1,500 fans. It was the top story on TSN across the country that night. We had all kinds of outpouring of support. And what it, uh, what it meant for the, like, well, it makes me emotional thinking about it because of what it meant to the families uh, and, and their banners hang in the arena in Fort Saskatchewan to this day. And so every time someone goes in there, they ask a question about who are these two gentlemen? Mm. And, and they get to hear the story one way or another about who they are and, and what they meant to everybody that knew them and loved them. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, and you can imagine, you know, even for those of you who are listening, you know, a simple way to just like kind of connect with that moment is to share like I, I can first first to acknowledge what did you hear was important to the listener or to the speaker. So we listen and we take in information, but we often don't share it back. And this is an act of listening, like repeat what they said. I'm not interested in that. I want us to go deeper. So, so the, first, the first thing that I think is a powerful question for us to always answer when we're listening to someone is what was important to them? What did you hear they valued? So I want to share with you, Jeff, what I heard you valued. Um, I, obviously, I heard that you valued your friends. I mean, it was clear that these were important enough people in your life that you wanted to do something pretty significant. But I also heard that paying it forward is important to you because it wasn't just that you were like doing something to honor them. You wanted to do something that would have a, a ripple effect, that it would pay forward their legacy. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I don't, this isn't necessarily something that's important to you, but I could feel like how powerful it was for you to have a bigger impact than you even intended, right? That moment when you're talking about it, like that's when the emotions came up. So those are just a few things that I heard were important to you. Yeah. And so I'm, and, 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 and so, so Jeff, I guess, let me ask you this. If we were in conversation and you told that story and my response instead, it was like, oh, that's cool. Let me tell you about the fundraiser I did for my friends. But if it was like, wow, that, like I can hear how important paying it forward is to you. I can yeah. hear how important those two friends are to you. Mm -hmm. I can, I can hear that, like, um, you know, being really thoughtful about continuing somebody's legacy is a value of yours. How would that, how does that make you feel as the person who just told your story? Yeah, val validated and heard and important and, uh, and, and, and like I matter. And so that's why, what a great exercise. And you're highly trained and skilled in active listening. Uh, you devoted your career to it. But I, I love the exercise because we all can do it and the more we do it, the better we'll get at it. And even just uh, an investment in somebody else's time is enough to create an enhanced connection. So yeah. Sarah, we could have spent another have. hour together. Wait, can I, I just have yeah. one more thought. Okay. I just like two more quick thoughts. One, when people feel heard, because I want to connect it, when people feel heard, that calms down the amygdala. When yeah. they feel heard, it actually triggers oxytocin and they feel more bonded. And what we have to understand, it's pretty simple what people want. They want to be seen, they want to be heard, and they want to know that they add value. And one of the ways we can do that is to make sure we listen to and speak out what is important to them. Excellent, Sarah, thank you. We, like I said, we could have spent another hour here. You, you have uh, such a wealth and depth of knowledge uh, in your area of expertise. Thank you for sharing that with us. And Thanks please reach out and connect this with Sarah on Twitter, on social media, on LinkedIn. She's got a terrific social media platform, highly engaging, highly informative. Now stay connected with us. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question, you can send those to info at unleashedresults.com and we'll get those questions to Sarah. We'll promise we'll get those answered. Uh, when you uh, leave the meeting today, click on the continue button on the left hand side. That is going to take you to a place where you can give us some meaningful feedback. Also an opportunity to sign up for a limited workshop. We're offering a 30 person workshop on culture and connection, building on some of the things that we discussed today. How do you build a high performing team in a remote environment? We've only got 30 spots for that. So please click uh, to register for that as you leave. And then I want to remind everybody about next week's special guest where we're going to be joined by Drew Dudley, and he has got a really, really interesting perspective on everyday leadership. Uh, he is such a wonderful, engaging speaker on the topic, and I guarantee he's gonna change the way that you think about leadership as well. So we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, we, uh, this is a highlight of our week every week, so thank you everybody that joined us today. We hope to see you back uh, next week, and please feel free to send these to your colleagues, to your friends, and don't forget to join the Shop Local Contest that expires tonight at midnight. Just tag your best local restaurant, your best local shop, wherever you might wanna go and spend some money with and uh, use the hashtag results unleashed and we will draw for a $50 gift card. The draw closes tonight at midnight. Thank you everybody, have a safe and wonderful day.